Hello, and welcome to a Fluidform research highlight. I'm Andrew Hudson. I am both a co-founder in Fluidform and currently a graduate student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. To go over the reasons for doing this research highlight series is two parts. The first is it gives a chance for research students, graduate students, postdocs, etc., to give more of a time to talk about their work and their contributions outside of the occasional conference that they go to maybe once or twice a year. The second is that we seek to provide a longer format series for researchers to talk about the methods that allow them to perform their research. I, as a graduate student, occasionally find it frustrating when a methods section is a little dry on details when you actually try and go to replicate them. So this whole series is giving them a chance to elongate the actual methods that they use to accomplish their work in order to also give them more credit. Our guest today is Dr. Andrew Lee. Very briefly, Dr. Lee got his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from UC San Diego in 2011 and his PhD in biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University in 2018 with his professor, Dr. Adam Feinberg. Today, Dr. Lee will be discussing his work on the paper, 3D Bioprinting of Collagen to Rebuild Components of the Human Heart, which he co-authored in Science in August of 2019. Since graduating, Andrew has helped co-found Fluidform, a startup company that seeks to fresh 3D print liquids previously impossible for applications ranging from biological research to high-performance materials. Without further ado, here is Dr. Andrew Lee. All right, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you on. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, it's, I think it's really fun to do these uh, interviews that are uh, nice and in person. Yeah, and, and hopefully either uh, young uh, young PhDs, postdocs, and grad students like talking about their work a little more. Um, I think that's that's, yeah. a, that's a big advantage that why I like doing these. Um, well, the second one is to also have researchers be able to talk about the specifics of their methods in, in more detail in case other people are curious, uh, more than you can get in just a five to 10 minute Q&A session at the end of a one or two times a year conference. Um, so the, the topic that we're gonna be discussing today is your large contribution to a paper that was published in Science in uh, August of 2019, which is about 3D bioprinting collagen to rebuild the heart. Um, and I think the substantial portion that, that you were working on was printing a IPS-derived uh, ventricle with cardiomyocytes using Fresh. Can you describe a little more about this ventricle that you were making? Yeah, uh, I just wanna first say the the paper we published uh, in Science was really a large part of group effort. It's we we had several PhDs, postdocs working on it, and everyone kind of took on their own piece. And uh, several people have multiple involvements in multiple pieces of that. And my my significant part portion of the project involved, uh, like you said, working on trying to generate a contractile ventricle model. Uh, using 3D printing, specifically uh, fresh 3D bioprinting. And uh, I think the ventricle was really interesting to us as a model because I think our lab at the time, so this was Professor Adam Feinberg's lab, uh, where, we, where we did this work, was interested or is interested in cardiac tissue engineering. And a lot of the work there has been done in two-dimensional studies. So looking at how cells uh, seed and then spread out on a 2D substrate that's been patterned with some sort of protein and then eventually looking at how those patterns can align these cells. And I think uh, one of the major challenges that's been described many times now is cells in our bodies are really in these three-dimensional tissues, right? They're in these three-dimensional microenvironments that uh, the 2D substrates don't exactly replicate and we, we have a hard time extrapolating that information to when we want to say, create a three-dimensional tissue and eventually use these tissues for therapeutic purposes or for uh, eventually down the line for implanting into patients. So what we thought about doing for the ventricle model was we wanted to create this uh, larger model that's three-dimensional that can be very easily uh, patterned or fabricated using a 3D printing process because 3D printing, the promise there really is to create the geometry using the right materials uh, and then assessing the function of this model. Um, and so, so using, using that framework, that concept, uh, we went to then thinking about how we would design this ventricle. Uh, one of the primary requirements there was we really wanted cells to be in high density because that's, that's the primary uh, mode where 
when cells in your body are electrically and mechanically coupled, uh, meaning that they're very tightly interconnected, that's where contractile, action, contractile function is the most efficient and most effective at pumping out blood. Um, and also, using 3D printing, we, we can then pattern cells and different materials in different places. And then, depending on how we design these placements of materials, we can really control function of this ventricle and uh, how, how exactly do we want to predict and use this ventricle model. So, so when you're talking about uh, a ventricle model, um... I think something that is always really important to to air out in these longer formats is what a headline might say and then what right. is actually the nitty-gritty detail. So when you say a ventricle model, can you go into the the, the scale, the size, uh, I don't know about force output, um, like how many cells and, and all that stuff, just so people understand when, when we say model versus an actual ventricle that it, it can't necessarily be transplanted yet, um, but where that's actually going to. Yeah, so your heart is really the average size of the heart is really the size of your fist. And these models, these ventricle models that we created are about uh, a centimeter tall uh, and maybe half a centimeter across. So we're very, very small in terms of the size. So we're, we're at a very scaled down level. Uh, we're focused on the 3D structure. And like you said, um, this, this is really just a model for eventually, hopefully we can extrapolate some sort of information from it uh, so that we can apply this knowledge towards future therapeutics. And so it certainly does not, is not something that you can implant into human. It's not close to being, to, to doing that. And it's, but then I think it's a good first step to really moving towards, uh, moving towards that direction. Uh, and then so the model is pretty simplistic. It's a, it's a model that's been commonly used to to, to recreate the left ventricle, which is really just, if you imagine a football cut in half and there's an opening uh, where you can imagine this opening closing and opening. Uh, and that's really just the, the very simplistic uh, left ventricle model that we created. So we printed this left ventricle using cells and using collagen uh, to create this structure. So you mentioned uh, right there at the end that there were two distinct inks. Can you go into yeah. uh, why you needed two distinct inks and what's what's really impressive about about each one? Yeah. So we we had like I said we had collagen and cells. Uh, both we thought were necessary because cells are really the major contractile unit that will that is responsible for contractions and then therefore if they all work together they can then and they're all positioned in the right places they can then contract together and then pump out fluid, right? Which is ultimately the function of your ventricles is to pump fluid, pump blood to the rest of your body. So we wanted to recreate that function. For the collagen, the collagen really is a major component in your heart uh, and also in a lot, in most of your organs as well. So in your heart, collagen is responsible for mechanical strength and also keeping everything together. So uh, holding the cells in place and then making sure that your ventricle doesn't, your heart doesn't rupture uh, during contractions and it's able to, your heart's able to contract billions of cycles throughout your lifetime. So uh, both are necessary there. And the way we printed this was that we had a multi-extrusion system, a multi-extrusion printer where we put, uh, two syringes that are able, that each held one of these inks. So one held a collagen ink and then one held a cell ink. And then what we did was that we, within a single file, we were able to print these two materials where one was printing and then after after this one was printing one layer, the next would come in and swap in the new, the new ink and then print that second material. Uh, and so that's how we printed these two inks. Um, and and both were really absolutely critical for for printing. Uh, I think in terms of the concentrations of each of these inks, uh, they were much higher than what you might encounter in a lot of tissue engineering studies. So for the collagen ink, we were printing at 24 megs per ml. And for the cells, we were printing at around 300 million cells per ml, which is ridiculously high, but we thought that was necessary to recreate that highly dense, highly concentrated uh, environment that cells are in inside our body. Yeah, and, and to your point, 300 million cells per, per mil is a lot to 
two other bio inks where people are one, maybe even two orders of magnitude lower than that. But it is getting closer to what it is actually native in the body where you're looking at roughly ballpark of a billion per milliliter. So there's there's still a gap in it. Even though you're printing, essentially you're printing a cell pellet, which is really cool. Right. Um, and even then there's still a little bit of density difference between that and native tissue. Um, but something else, aside from just basically printing a cell pellet, um, the whole thing that was enabled by this was how fresh allows for different and more chemistries to be printed, where it wasn't just cells there. I think was there's some fibrinogen in there and yeah. collagen is really difficult to print with traditional techniques. Can you talk about why fresh allows you to print both of those things together? Yeah, I think uh, if I just elaborate more on these inks. Uh, so first we had a pure collagen ink that was 24 mg per mil. So that was kept inside a syringe. That was an acidic bio ink. So acidic collagen ink because collagen is soluble in, in acidic conditions. And the way that collagen gels is via a temperature sensitive, is via a temperature system and also uh, a buffer based, well, a pH driven system. So when you neutralize collagen from acidic to a neutral condition, uh, you are able to drive gelation of collagen. And also similarly, when you raise the temperature of collagen to around body temperature, which is around 37 degrees Celsius, you also encourage some of that gelation uh, of collagen. And so that's one of the inks. Uh, and then the second ink was, a, was cells containing fibrinogen, like you said, um, if you imagine just kind of extruding out a cell pellet, so basically a lot of cells packed in together into a solution, the cells will, after you extrude them, they'll just kind of fall apart. And when you melt away the support material that, we, that we're using for fresh, uh, cells will just flow everywhere. They won't stay in the places that we want them to stay in. So, so the fiber engine really was there to hold everything in place. And the way we gelled this fiber engine was we added thrombin into our support material. And so what happens is that when you extrude this cell plus fibrinogen solution into our support material, the fibrinogen gets cleaved into fibrin, and that's the mechanisms by which it gels, is that thrombin cleaves that fibrinogen. And then this trace amount of fibrinogen really holds the cells in place so that you end up with these filaments of cells and also three-dimensional structures of cells that you printed. So. Uh, I think really the key there is modulating or tuning this support material or the liquid phase of the support material. So what we did was that we had a buffer, uh, a pH neutral buffer to gel the collagen as it's being printed. And then also within the su same support material, we had thrombin to gel the fibrinogen and cell solution as it's being printed. And that's, that's kind of how we were able to print two materials at the same time with very distinct gelation chemistries. And that's something I think not a lot of techniques out there can do or not that, not ones that I'm aware of. Yeah, I think uh, the short end that we summarize is that fresh just allows for new chemistries to be printed where you're printing something that yeah. in the, is, one ink is pH sensitive, the other one is enzymatic. Um, I think the, the best attempts people were trying to do that in open air was just kind of spraying them with those solutions, but it, at least with, with fresh, you're, you're printing into those and they're ubiquitously exposed. Um, but when you're doing 3D printing, or at least this method, uh, there's obviously lots of different types of 3D printing out there. Um, it's obviously an FDM format, which means it's in this case, layer by layer. I know the F in, in Fresh stands for free form, so we can do uh, X, Y, and Z movements simultaneously. But when you're doing these X, Y plane prints, do you actually get cellular alignment in the direction of those slices or of within the extrusion of a single fiber? How does that work out? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, uh, and that's a question that we we get a lot. Uh, I think that's something that that uh, there's been a lot of research that has shown that during extrusion you can start to align different fibers that have been filled into a solution. So kind of short nanofibers that as they as you extrude out of a needle, they really start to align. Um, I think something similar happens in collagen. That's not something that we really looked uh, extensively into, and. Um, I think that's something that is very interesting to study because a lot of studies also have shown that cells really respond to not just uh, microscale cues, but also nanoscale cues, where if you have little nanofibers, uh, nanoscale collagen, micro, collagen fibers that align, cells really respond to those cues. So 
that's something interesting. What we saw in our prints actually was that when we pushed out uh, our cell ink, um, they really originally they kind of they're pushing these filament forms. So they, when we extrude them, they come out as individual filaments that then get stacked on top of each other. And then what we had hoped to see were was that cells would align to these filaments, and that's actually exactly what we saw. Was that uh, we printed these filaments in the circumferential direction, uh, and then we just kind of moved layer by layer up to the top. And after around 14 days, even seven days in culture, we really begin to see the cells align in the circ circumferential direction. Um, and that could be due to printing. That could be due to initial extrusion, where cells are biased in, by the printing process. It could be that cells respond to the constraints they have, the, uh, the boundary conditions that they, they meet. So we printed these cells uh, within a filament, so maybe cells are responding to the boundary conditions imposed by that filament. Also, maybe they're responding to uh, these two collagen shells that we printed around them so that so they, they can't really go anywhere else, so they, they tend to align in the direction uh, where they, they most easily align. Um, and then also the last piece to that is uh, cells also, cells like to pull in, on the environment around them. So in this cell ink, we also included fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. And I think in the process of them really exploring in this three-dimensional space, they also start to generate this uh, contractile force. Uh, and this contractile force also allows them to align. And that's been shown in a lot of studies and two-dimensional studies and also in 3D tissue studies around where cells are casted around pillars. And so I think that's that could be another part to this alignment that we saw in our ventricle models was that they align due to the stresses that they generated and then therefore they, uh, they wanted to compact the structure around these ventricle shells and then therefore they aligned around these ventricle shells. Right, so you're able to get circumferential contraction largely because you're, you're printing them circumferentially, which is really neat. Yeah. Um, you like the the core aspect of being able to print that ventricle is having uh, the collagen solution and the cell solution, which implies you're doing multi-material printing. And a lot of people want to do multi-material printing, but it's currently, in at least my opinion, really difficult to do that well. Can yeah. you give tips? And this is a great example of when you're reading the methods, you just think, oh yeah, they have an ink A and an ink B, and they just print it. But when you actually go to do that on whatever printer you have. If you're off by tens or hundreds of microns, suddenly it just doesn't work because you have inks that should be separate or now interdigitating with one another. Yeah, I think that's actually, this is why this format I think is really cool because uh, like, you, like you said, I would read some sort of paper and I would think, oh, I can exactly replicate the protocols and methods and maybe I'll be able to, to do the same thing. And I think a lot of times what we find is that we can't actually do that. Uh, and I think this is one example of that. Uh, Multi-material printing is hard, uh, mm -hmm. and it was it's something that we figured out and something that we laid out, I think, in as much detail as possible in the methods. Um, but it's it's difficult, and the reason that the reason why it's difficult is because you really need to, like you said, align the needles that you want to align. So say you have two syringes that each are each have a needle attached to them. What you really need to do is you need to register the tips of these, these needles so that your machine knows to not run one needle into uh, the previous previous parts that the print that the, the machine has printed out. So, say so how it works usually is you have um, one extruder containing a syringe with a needle that comes in prints, and then in our system we lifted this lifted the entire axis up and we move the next syringe into place. So what's really important there is that you don't run the second syringe, the second needle, into previously printed uh, extrusions. And if you do, you really ruin your entire print. So aligning these two positions of these needles are really critical. And what we did was we, we followed this very simple workflow of looking, uh, aligning these needles to a very precise ruler. And we use these thumb screws that really uh, took a lot of practice to manipulate manipulate them into place. Uh, and then we tell the machine that these these two needles are in these known positions so that the machine can very precisely place them as you're changing tools or moving between two syringes. 
So I think that's that's definitely one uh, one option. I think another one that I've seen is you'll you'll have, I guess what's called like a, a reference frame or reference block in this case, where you're doing the the, the two overall methods are you forcibly adjust needles into position according to something that is static where you you know it's always this x y and z apart and then you you physically adjust your needles to be those things or they're a little bit messed up but then you have a reference object that is something else and you always bring it to this exact corner then you bring up your second needle and you bring that to this exact corner in doing this type of like jogging you you know that it's you know 12.23 millimeters in this direction and then 1.2 in another one um, so it's a great example of it's not really a problem that's been perfectly solved yet, as far as I know. Um, yeah, and I think I think it's not a hard problem to solve at all. It's yeah. it's just that it's it takes some time, and it it probably just takes a grad student's work to to develop these uh, methods to then align these needles. And there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of industrial ind industrial machines that very easily align tools, right? So if you yeah. look at CNC machines, they can switch between tools very easily. And there's a lot of solutions out there that just need to get get transferred and implemented onto printers and get them onto different printers so that people with different printers can use them. So uh, I think there's solutions there that take some time. And I think that's something that, that's really cool about 3D printing is that you incorporate so much knowledge from other industries and yeah. to really make it more capable to do what we want to do. Yeah, I guess the, the short end for anyone watching, it really depends on your printer, depends on your system. If it's custom built, maybe there's a commercial one um, the ultimate goal is to just make sure that when your needles go from, from A to B that they're going to the exact same spot. Because even yep. if you're off by one diameter, internal diameter of a, of a needle width, then the whole thing could be, could be uh, compromised, which is really frustrating. But um, I think it's a problem that a lot of people are trying to solve, which, which gives me hope. Right. Um, right. So, so you, have these, you have at least a, a ventricle now, but science is all based on replication. So how difficult and how laborious is it to now get multiple ones of those to study different I know that you iterated on fiberglass concentration um, right what is it like to try and culture enough cells for basically for cell pellet printing uh, it was not fun I'll just say that <laughs> uh, but the end results were fun um, but I think the challenge there like you described was that we really need to replicate these tissues right create multiple of these ventricles to then study and understand things with confidence. But the challenge there is that because we were printing with such a high concentration ink, we really needed a lot of cells. And I think a lot of people that have done cell culture, or if you're not familiar with cell culture, cell culture is this fairly laborious, expensive, and also time-consuming process to generate cells, uh, to expand, to seed cells onto a two-dimensional substrate, expand them, allow them to proliferate, keep them alive, and then and then be able to use them at a later date for experiment. And this this is especially challenging for stem cells, and especially challenging for induced pluripotent stem cells and also embryonic pluripotent embryonic stem cells. So we use embryonic stem cells. In our paper, uh, for the majority of the experiments, we explored other stem cell options as well. And what we needed to do was we needed to take these embryonic stem cells, or ESCs, and take them and differentiate them to become cardiomyocytes, which are heart cells. So that process alone takes about, uh, I believe, takes about three weeks to get to get from stem cells to a plate of purified cardiomyocytes. And a plate of cardio a plate of purified cardiomyocytes gets us about 5 million cells per plate. So if you think about that number in comparison to a 300 million cells per ml, if we were to get 1 ml of, of ink, we need 300 million cells. So that means we need about uh, 60, flasks, 60 yeah. flasks in there. So 60 flasks, and you kind of space these out. You can't do 60 flasks all at once. So it was me and another grad student, Jackie, who spent a lot of time culturing these cells. So I think if I were to roughly estimate, it might take us about two months, two to three months to really get 60 flasks yeah. for one milliliter of cell ink. And that one milliliter cell ink translates to, I think about four to five ventricles being printed. So you can imagine not being able to replicate very quickly was a bottleneck and that was really just a, a function of cells being hard to generate and 
just we don't have a very efficient process right now in stem cell technology to very quickly move uh, and very quickly scale up without just physically churning out multiple plates with a lot of grad students or a lot of higher techs that yeah. uh, that help with getting these cells out. So it was expensive, it was time consuming, and that's that, that was a challenging part to that, uh, to generating rep repetitions, replications. Yeah, so it sounds like if anyone should first practice, they're gonna, they should practice with something that's more robust, faster expansion, like a C2C12 myoblast line. Right. Um, cause I think what you're talking about, if you, if it takes you two months to expand these plates out and then you're just doing for the very first time, this needle alignment and you're, you're slow cause it's the very first time and your cells are dying is kind of a, a stressful situation. So I think, uh, maybe do a trial run with a, a lower value <laughs> cell line. Um, yeah. And I, think, recommended. I think another, another thing to mention there is that 3d bioprinting is, it's kind of growing into this direction of a lot of a lot of there's a lot of um, information out there where people are trying to really make it a a uh, click and play option where you you slot in your material and you can start printing and but I think it's more than that it's uh, a lot of it is it's you need to really understand your cells you need to put you need to get these cells into a syringe you need to get your other material to put into a syringe and then you need to figure out your file so this entire workflow is really long, and I think it takes a lot of understanding of each process to really get get used to it. And so some practice there helps, and then also just very carefully reading some of the literature out there, um, and then making sure you understand what's what's being put into each piece of this workflow. I think that's yeah, yeah it's it's a it's a time consuming process, but I think it's a rewarding one for sure. So after these these ventricle, you have at least one that's done in a in a dish of fresh. I guess my first question is how how long does it take to print like a thimble, maybe tip of pinky size thing, and then how gentle do you have to be with it? How do you actually start handling these things? What do you, what do you have to do right after it's printed? Yeah, uh, I so if I remember correctly, uh, it took me around twenty to twenty five minutes to print each of these uh, each of these ventricles. Um, but I think a lot there's a lot of questions around print time a lot of times, and print time really depends on the size of your print and also the complexity of your geometry. So if you are just printing very simple, with each layer you're just printing one single line, obviously your, your print will be much faster than when you're trying to fill in each layer with much more material, with much more passes of the needle. Yeah. So I think, so for this very particular print, we really optimized around around the amount of time we thought we could keep the cells alive inside a syringe. So we try to keep it down to around an hour to two hours uh, of work working time with the cells. And so making sure they stay alive while we're printing them inside the syringe and we can very quickly print them so that we keep them, we get them into a condition where they're happier than inside a syringe. Um, and in terms of after printing, uh, so usually after printing, like we said, uh, we have this collagen uh, scaffold that holds the internal structure of the cells together. And so, and then we, we printed that structure and we can then release the support material. And so when this support material is released, we can exchange it for media, which is how we keep the structure alive. And we really just place this thing and let it rest on the bottom of a dish. So, and just keep it in media and let it, and try not to disturb it. Because these things are really, really, really soft. And so, if, it, it'll deform if you try to take a spatula and kind of you can kind of poke it around and I I've gotten really good at poking these things around <laughs> with a spatula but if you were to take the spatula and really gently lift it out of solution even the surface tension breaking that surface tension will plastically deform your structure and when you put it back into solution it won't keep its shape anymore so what we try to do is we keep it in culture uh, and we don't disturb it for for we don't disturb it during culture. What we did was we, we would very gently exchange media and then we we wanted the cells to really set up shop and really mature the structure on their own. We wanted the fibroblasts to reorganize the matrix we put around them and then we want the, the cardiomyocytes to interconnect and then they can form a more, much more rigid structure that is more, uh, that, that is more flexible, much more uh, with higher structural integrity. So. Yeah. 
I think after 14 days of culture, they're much more robust and they can be handled much easier. Gotcha. So you got a ventricle that's now 14 days old. It's twitching, yep. kind of. You can see it under a microscope that looks really cool. What do you What do you do with it to, to actually get some data? Yeah, it was, it was definitely awesome to see <laughs> when the first the first time I got it, we we saw twitching in our ventricle. So, so that was really cool. Uh, in terms of getting data from them, we kind of followed a fairly uh, standard way of assessing function in cardiac tissues. So. First, we looked at uh, we we just looked at the structure component, right? So, we looked at if we placed the cells in the right places where we printed them. So we took a ventricle, cut it in half, and looked at the cross section. So we we saw a really nice placement of collagen cells and collagen material, and then we looked at what happened to these cells during culture. Did they did they die off? Did they align? Or what what did they do? And what we found was that cells actually didn't die off too much. Um, we got very nice, even coverage of cells in where we printed them. And that's mainly because our tissue layer wasn't too thick. And then we also saw that the cells really started to align, like we previously said. Um, they aligned around in the cir circumferential direction uh, around the ventricle. So that got us really excited. And the next step there was then to take this alignment data. We know that they've aligned. So and we also can visibly see that they're contracting. So are they contracting in the direction of that alignment, uh, which is what we hope to see. Um, and so in order to kind of investigate that, we use calcium imaging, which is really just staining for the calcium activity. We have this marker that stains for the calcium activity inside cells. And so when cells contract, uh, they really cycle calcium very rapidly. And this cycling of calcium is we use it as a visual indicator for contractile activity. And what's really cool is that if you kind of watch some of the videos that are posted online, you can see this calcium wave propagation that indicates that cells are contracting in the direction of their alignment. They kind of have this nice even coverage around the ventricles and uh, they, they spontaneously contract over time. Uh, and so that was, that was encouraging for us and we then moved on to looking at, okay, can we can we now control this contraction? Can we stimulate the entire ventricle and can we get it to contract all at once? And we were able to do that very successfully at different frequencies. Uh, we were also able to measure out uh, how fast are these uh, calcium waves moving? So how fast are the, are the uh, conduction velocities of these, of these uh, cells? So that was, those were very interesting experiments that were uh, nicely outlined in the paper. Um, and then, the next step to kind of investigating the function of these ventricles is to see can we start to replicate some of the native functions of the heart, right? So we know that the ventricle in the body really wants to, its function is to push out, pump out blood by restricting volume of the ventricle. So contracting so that you reduce volume of the ventricle and therefore you're ejecting fluid from inside the ventricle. So we want to see if that volume decreased with uh, respect to our printed ventricle. So we we did a very simple study by just looking at the opening, the diameter of the opening of that ventricle. So did it decrease in area uh, over time over different contractile cycles? And we found that it did. Um, and also we saw that what was really interesting was that we saw also wall thickening. So during contraction, your cardiomyocytes contract and then in the other direction, they, they thicken. And so that is a hallmark of, uh, of contraction in the native heart. So we also saw that as well. So I think taking all of what I just said together, these were good indicators that we are moving in the right direction, that we're kind of making this model that is able to replicate some of the things that you find inside your heart, uh, for example. And there's obviously a lot of studies that need to be done on top of that, but we're doing these first steps that really are getting us to to a starting point for a model. What would be the the next things if you had more ventricles tomorrow? Yeah. What would be the next things that you would like to study with them? Yeah, there's there's so many things. Uh, there's I think the first thing I would want to look at is can we because we're using a three D printing technology, uh, can we structure our cells and our collagen? in such a way that we can bias their alignment, right? Can we control their alignment so that we can then control their contractile behavior? So can we make that contractile 
activity much more efficient and therefore can we more effectively push out blood uh, or push out fluid from our ventricle model. So I think that's the first thing I would want to look at. It's, it's a really cool project. Uh, the next thing to look at is um, maybe exploring some of the functions of these ventricles. So how well do they respond to drugs? And these are studies that are being regularly done uh, in more s in simpler three-dimensional studies and especially in 2D substrates. But I think it's really interesting to then look at a structure that really replicates a, uh, a structure found in the body and then see how that responds to different therapeutics. And then also use, we can also maybe engineer some sort of disease into the ventricles, right? So putting in uh, disease cells uh, by printing disease cells into the ventricle, and then maybe we can model some of the uh, arrhythmogenic activity that's found uh, when these disease cells are introduced or maybe they're contracting less and then if we can replicate this disease in a dish, can we then rescue its function by, uh, by engineering or introducing new therapeutics that are being investigated? So those are really interesting studies that, that can be done. And I think we're really looking forward to seeing some of the work that comes out of this. Neat. Uh, I know that we, we've touched upon like certain aspects that were particularly difficult, like cell culture throughput, um, dual material needle alignment. Are there, are there other things that someone might glance over in the methods when they're trying to replicate this? I don't know if anything off the top of your head is, is still outstanding. I think we, we touched upon a, upon a couple of things. Yeah, I think we touched upon a lot of the challenging things. Um, I think one, one aspect I, I always come back to is uh, the handling of the cells was was challenging at least for me. Uh, it wasn't it was wasn't something that's in the native workflow of uh, you don't handle this many cells at once, and you don't put them into syringes typically. And so what we did was we kind of took a pellet of cells, we transferred it in a syringe, and we mixed up this pellet so that it's kind of homogenous to be printed with. And I think that was uh, somewhat challenging because you're really trying to be, be very careful, but also you don't want to. Uh, introduce error into your process. So I would encourage practicing with less expensive cells, for example, which is what I did. Uh, or maybe practicing with other materials, even just water, for example. So uh, the, that process was, I think, once, you're get, once you get used to it, it's, it's not too hard, but it's something that's worth mentioning. Uh, I think aside from that, uh, there's really just, again, it's, I think 3D printing is this kind of it's this tool that we can use to enable us to study all these things. So it's really interesting because 3D printing now enables us to create these structures, but we also need to need to really think about the experiments we want to run with 3D printing. So uh, really understand cellular biology and also really understand the outcomes uh, that we want, the metrics that we want to measure from our printed structures, right? So for example, in our case, we wanted to look at uh, contractile function. So we used calcium imaging as well as some of the imaging techniques to then measure out uh, just very simple aspects of our of our ventricle. So I think I think it's really cool that we can now do a lot of things and but we now have a lot of things to consider as well. So I think that's my commentary on that. <laughs> yeah. And then I always I always like to end these on kind of a, a, a pretty free form question which if you're a grad student getting into 3D bioprinting what would mm -hmm. be your top couple of recommendations? Don't have to put a number on it, but what are what would be the things that would most greatly accelerate or greatly guarantee long-term success with a 3D bioprinting project? Yeah, I think uh, like any research uh, or research approach, I would just encourage uh, really awareness of all the 3D printing techniques out there. So for example, if you're if you're thinking about if you're interested in the extrusion-based technique, I would still encourage uh, a grad student, a new, a newly grad student that's new to bioprinting, to learn about light-based techniques, uh, to learn about metal-based metal 3D printing, because I think there's a lot of parallels there that can be learned and a lot of uh, information that that really helps you during your research. So uh, being aware of these different techniques is really important. And then also the second piece of that is also I would say start with practicing with uh, 3D printing in general. So the easiest way right now is that 3D printing is so accessible in this uh, layer by layer extrusion based 
process, right? So printing plastics uh, is you can buy a $500 thermal plastic printer, uh, and that prints really well. That you can print really anything with, and so there's a lot of concepts there that can be learned. There's a lot of concepts in terms of machine movements. How do you control a printer? How do you create a CAD file? How do you set up that CAD file to then be uh, path so that you can print that CAD file? And then what sort of considerations do you need to take for for the material side, for the machine side, and for the printing side? And I think all that knowledge translates very well into pla into bioprinting, which is really just an extension of, of those techniques, except now you're printing with your own materials. So uh, I, I think those two major aspects would be what I recommend a new grad student uh, to, to pay attention to and to really think about doing. Great, I think that's really good advice. I definitely agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, <laughs> So I think uh, on that note, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much for joining us and I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right, take care. Bye. Thanks for watching this research highlight. We hope you found it useful. Leave a like or a comment below so that other researchers can find research and work like this. Thanks.